When we talk about the industrial transformation of the American economy in the late 19th century, we start with railroads. It would be very difficult to overstate the importance of the railroad network and the expansion of the railroad network in the second half of the 19th century to the other economic developments we're going to discuss. And there are a few reasons for this. Uh, the first reason uh, may seem fairly obvious, but it's worth stating out loud, that the railroad network represented the transportation and communication infrastructure on which the goods and other economic developments we're going to talk about moved on more freely. Uh, there's a rough analogy here with what we talked about in Module 2 when we talked about the influence of canals. And there was enormous expansion of the railroad network in the late 19th century and also ways that the railroad network got more efficient as a transportation network. So for example, in the middle of the 19th century, as railroads were first uh, being built around the country, they were usually built as regional networks and were not always closely integrated with one another all over the country. Just because there was a rail line on the map between Chicago and Boston didn't necessarily mean you could get on a train in Chicago and arrive in Boston on the same train. By the turn of the 20th century, the railroad network had coalesced into the hands of a relatively small number of large firms and the railroad network itself had gotten more efficient as a transportation network in a variety of ways through things like rail companies uh, sharing cars with one another, pooling cars, and making it more likely in 1890 or 1900 that you could get out a train in Chicago, or more importantly that you could put goods on a train in Chicago, and it would arrive uh, at a relatively distant point in a much more efficient way than it would have in 1840 or 1850. Just to give you uh, a kind of a visual sense of what we're talking about here, this is a rail map of Ohio in 1892. This is not a street map, this is a railroad map. This is how much of the state you could get to from the rest of the state on the commercial rail network uh, by the 1890s. And we could show similar maps in much of the industrial northeast and midwest. Southern and western maps might be slightly more sparse than that. But this is the extent of the rail network we're discussing by the time we get to the 1890s. Another reason railroads are so important to these economic transformations is that the railroads in the United States were pioneers in bigness. And what I mean by this is that the railroads were the first private corporations in the United States to get so large, both literally in the physical sense of the actual percentage of the country that they covered with infrastructure, and also so large as business institutions, as organizations, and as bureaucracies, that they were the first companies to have to learn how to be that large efficiently. And a lot of the basic business techniques and practices and organizational techniques that they pioneered wound up spreading throughout the rest of the economy as these trends spread to other industries. Um, it may seem strange today to talk about a bureaucracy as an efficient thing, but these large corporations had to construct relatively efficient bureaucratic organizations that allowed information about the business to flow smoothly up and down a relatively sophisticated flowchart. And then the people who sat in those desks uh, represented a new kind of middle class individual that we'll talk a little bit about uh, in a, one of our next mini lectures. And a lot of the trends that the uh, railroads pioneered in terms of uh, finding the capital on international markets to finance themselves, building efficient organizations, tracking the flow of goods across hundreds if not thousands of miles of railroad across the country, uh, these spread uh, to other industries in the late 19th century. Finally, the railroad formed a kind of symbiotic relationship with a series of other important uh, the core industries in the late 19th century, especially the coal, iron, and steel industries. First of all, these businesses were all one another's best customers. Uh, you have to use a lot of iron and steel to build a railroad network across the country, uh, and coal was the primary industrial fuel at the time. There are also a variety of ways in which the steel industry in particular allowed a series of the transformations in the American city that we're going to talk about in the late 19th century uh, to take place. Um, steel uh, in uh, 19th century terms was sort of a miracle substance, a kind of wonder substance that was light and efficient to build with. And before the late 19th century, steel was very expensive. Uh, it had to be made largely by hand, by skilled workers. Uh, 
But in the late 19th century, uh, a series of industrial techniques that made it possible to make large amounts of steel cheaply uh, in large factories uh, made it possible to transform a whole series of things about the built environment uh, because of the existence uh, of inexpensive steel. So these are pictures of steel mills in Pittsburgh uh, uh, in the late 19th century. Pittsburgh was a city uh, that was transformed uh, physically and from an economic standpoint uh, by the steel industry. Um, and it's actually worth thinking about the sheer physical size of this uh, and the sheer physical impact of living next to it, working in it, or living in a city dominated by it. Um, one of the ways that the steel industry in the late 19th century figured out how to be efficient uh, using the kind of business techniques that we talked about when we talked about railroads is that Andrew Carnegie, the person who built the steel industry in the Pittsburgh area, uh, managed to get wealthy both basically by controlling the cost of steel and not worrying so much about the price of steel. Uh, one of the ways they did that is that they figured out that there was a lot of waste if you turned a steel mill on and off. Once the thing was on and hot, you wanted to keep it hot and control how much steel you made by the flow of raw materials through the infrastructure. Uh, and so in the late 19th century, the work regime in the steel industry was two 12-hour shifts. And it wasn't uncommon uh, for steel workers to be expected at some point to work a 24-hour turnaround shift so that they could flip the shift from day to night. And then inexpensive steel makes a series of other things in the city possible. Um, so we uh, showed you this picture of, uh, of Manhattan from Brooklyn in 1903. Um, the thing I like about this picture uh, as a means of explaining some of the things we're talking about here is that even though if you literally stood there today and took the same picture, or actually what you could do is that you could put, you could go to Google Earth and you could put the little green man on the bridge and achieve more or less the same thing at your own computer. If you did that, the only thing that would literally be in both pictures would probably be the bridge, which was constructed in the 1880s and was itself one of the first significant pieces of American infrastructure that was made possible because of the relatively inexpensive steel in the wire holding up the bridge. But this is a New York that has recently been transformed by the fact that you can build tall buildings, that you can build uh, uh, urban transportation infrastructure relatively, uh, relatively cheaply and inexpensively. This is recognizably modern New York. And in some key ways, this picture is, in terms of what it was like to live, is closer in some ways to how we live today than this picture was to this picture of New York taken uh, a generation earlier around the time of the Civil War. And it's inexpensive steel that makes a lot of this possible. Um, for example, in the late 19th century, American cities don't just continue to spread outward, they begin to spread up. And inexpensive steel makes that possible. Um, there's a kind of natural limit to how tall you can build something out of masonry or out of brick. The taller you go, the thicker the walls have to be. There's a kind of natural limit to, to how tall you would want to build something like that. Plus, it also helps if someone has invented the elevator, which has also happened in the 19th century. And the elevator is also a, uh, a product, uh, a technology, that depends on inexpensive steel cables so that you don't actually plummet to your death uh, as you're actually going up and down, up and down the floors. And so the building on the left is the uh, headquarters of the New York World newspaper, which was built in 1890. And when it was built, it was the first structure in New York City, the first uh, private structure, that was taller than the tallest church steeple in the city. And was the first of a generation of what they began to call skyscrapers that were built uh, over the next 10 to 20 years in New York and also Chicago. Um, and this is newspaper, roll, uh, newspaper Row in New York. Uh, several of these other buildings were headquarters of newspapers. That's the Tribune in the middle. Uh, one of the original, uh, one of the older buildings of the New York Times uh, is on the right. Um, as we'll see when we discuss college football and its relationship to the daily newspaper, 
the newspaper industry in the 1890s uh, was growing and expanding in a variety of creative ways, both in terms of circulation and in terms of what kind of product they produced. And those moguls spent some of that money building huge imposing skyscrapers right next to New York City Hall. And this is the kind of urban infrastructure that isn't really technologically possible until there are large amounts of inexpensive iron and steel uh, available in the economy. And so these industrial developments had a significant impact literally on what kind of city you could build. And as we'll see in the next mini lecture, many of the business techniques that these uh, industries pioneered uh, uh, spread to other areas of the American economy. And the existence of this the basic symbiotic industrial core in the late 19th century made possible a series of technological innovations in other industries.